Hello everyone. Today I'm going to tell you a secret story, one we all know. My name is ZK Leverton, and this is Breakfast with Gilgamesh. There's a place in the Old World called Mesopotamia. It's a Greek word that means between two rivers, referring to the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which create the natural borders of this place. Mesopotamia was a rich, fertile land where the earliest agriculture, cities, and religions that we know about sprang up some 5,000 years or so ago. Today, Mesopotamia is largely made up of parts of Iraq, Kuwait, Syria, Iran, and Turkey. Archaeologists have uncovered hundreds of thousands of tablets written in cuneiform, an elegant, logographic writing system used largely to keep tabs on taxes, debts, and land ownership. Pretty boring, functional stuff. However, from this place of two rivers sprang some of the oldest stories we still tell today, and sometimes those stories were written on these tablets, and some of those tablets were recovered in the modern era, and passed all the way down through six millennia of generations, to us. Today, I'm going to tell you probably the oldest of these oldest stories. The story is universal, spanning many religions and cultural traditions across the world. However, this telling of it belongs to me, and is my responsibility in the tradition of the oral storyteller. So I hope you'll forgive any embellishments, deviations, or outright flights of fancy I indulge in as I tell it to you. So now, let's begin with the secret story. A very, very long time ago, before there was Zeus, or Odin, or even Gilgamesh, there lived a man named Pazur Amuri. Pazur Amuri was a builder of boats. When you live by the river, boats are important. They were round, made of rope, reeds, and a little bitumen. They were called kufars, and they were just about unsinkable. Puzur's boats were famous throughout the land, from the great city of Shurapak, where he worked and lived, and all down the Euphrates River, where his customers used his kufar to fish and travel. He certainly wasn't the only builder of boats, but he was probably the best, by his estimation anyway. On a hot summer day, Puzur was approached by a local scholar, Utnapishtim. Utnapishtim was wealthy and well regarded by everyone in Shurapak. He was wise and pious a thoughtful and devoted member of the community. But today, Pazur noticed that Utnapishtim seemed disheveled. His robe was wrinkled, his beard was uncombed, and his eyes were wild as he approached Pazur's workshop on the bank of the river that morning. Utnapishtim, it's been so long. How have you been? Pazur Amori, boat builder. I must speak with you. Oh, uh, of course, Elder. What can I do for you on this bright summer day? I have received a most grave message from the gods, Pazur Amuri. Now, Pazur knew that Utnapishtim was a very holy man, devoted to his religion and generous in his charity. He thought, Who am I to question this? If Utnapishtim says the gods have spoken to him, then they've spoken to him. Pazur stepped out from under the canopy he'd been working under, and took Utnapishtim by the shoulders as a friend. What have the gods told you, wise Utnapishtim? Utnapishtim considered telling Pazur the truth, which was that he had been sitting in his reed house, meditating, when he heard a voice he knew, but had never heard. A whisper through the gaps of his wall tell him something so upsetting, so earth-shattering, that he tore at his beard and wailed into his hands all morning. He decided against this. The gods have decreed that I am not to live on land, Puzuramori. The water god Enki has decreed that my feet are not to touch the earth, and so I come to you, boat builder. 
Huzor listened to this and strained himself not to make a face. What kind of a decree was that for a god to make? Why Udna pished him? Surely the old man had lost it. You want me to build you a boat? Yes, boat builder. A boat you're going to live in forever? Yes, boat builder. Huzor rubbed the back of his neck and squinted at the sun, grimacing against the heat and thinking. It'll have to be big. Big means expensive, Elder. Yes, boat builder. I suppose you'll want enough room for your family? Yes, boat builder. And your belongings, maybe some livestock. Are, are you sure about this, Udna pished him? Yes, boat builder. Well, I can get started on plans right away. It'll take me some time to come up with the design of such a huge vessel. No need for all that, said Utna Pishtim. I've got the plans right here. Pazur was stunned. Had he simply not noticed the cuneiform tablet in Utna Pishtim's hand? Had it just appeared there? He took the tablet and read it. What he saw was astounding. The dimensions were exact, and there was even a list of required materials. It would be the most ambitious project he and his team had ever attempted. An ark, round in shape and equal in dimension, made of solid wood, rope, and barrel upon barrel of bitumen. He would have to make orders of a magnitude that would embarrass him. But perhaps most incredibly, when he read these instructions, he realized as he did that this structure was... possible. It could be built, and if it were built to the specifications provided, it would float quite comfortably though a great deal of it would float below the waterline. He found himself wondering not if he could build it, but if he did, would it even fit in the Euphrates? For weeks, Puzur Amuri and his team of men gathered the materials to build the vessel. They worked under the hot sun, lashing wood to rope, weaving reeds into the walls of the boat, and slathering bitumen onto the base of the structure to make it waterproof. They cut down vast swaths of trees to make a rolling plank and built the base of the structure on top of it. They designed massive pillars of solid wood and built three decks, one on top of another, with living quarters at the top. The boat's frame could be seen from the far end of Sharopak, towering over the reeds. All hours of the day, there was the noise of men working, cutting, tying, pouring and binding. The men had no nails or hammers. Those things hadn't been invented yet. But that's the thing about human beings. They're clever, and if you set them to a task, and pay them enough, they tend to find a way. Udna Pishtim hadn't left the valley since the morning he commissioned the boat. His wife would come by, feed him, bathe him in the river, and be off with a polite smile and to see you tomorrow. Pazur couldn't understand it. Why would the gods torment the man like this? To ask him to give up his fortune to build this monstrosity, to leave such a lovely wife at home to worry, to append his entire life. What had Utnapishtim done to deserve this from the gods, for whom he had dedicated his life? The answers to these questions came when the basic structure had been completed, and Pazur offered Utnapishtim a bit of a tour. They were standing among the intricate latticework of the center deck, when Utnapishtim noticed that there was no roof for the boat. Puzur gave him a quizzical look and said, Elder, a roof might not be the best idea. You might need to escape, and if we seal the top with a roof, how will you get out if the riverbed scrapes the bottom and it takes on a leak? Udna Pishtim sighed and puzzled for a moment, then said, Puzur Amori, you are a good and honest man. You have done incredible work for me, and I have deceived you. Puzur didn't know what to say. You paid your bills on time. My craftsmen are happy in their work, and the boat is well made by your own designs. What deception could you be referring to, Elder? Udna Pishtim looked up at the beams of light coming through the latticework of the boat and said, Come to my home, and we'll talk. Huzur and Utna Pishtim sat on the clean earthen floor of Utna Pishtim's house. Utna Pishtim's wife, happy to have her husband home, baked sweet bread and doted on her husband as he stroked his beard and nursed the same worried expression he had worn since the day he hired Huzur. 
It was dark out, and Pazor listened to the heron's song rise from the marshes. He ate his bread and waited patiently in silence for the old man to speak. What I'm going to tell you will distress you, Pazor Amori, but my heart cannot bear to deceive you any longer. However, I must swear you to secrecy. Then I am sworn, Elder. What is it? Udnapishtim told Pazor his secret, as I tell it to you now. On the dawn of the day in question, Utnapishtim was visited by the whispering voice that he knew but had never heard before. It was, as he had said, the water god Enki. The message Enki had for Utnapishtim was this. Pay heed to my advice that you may live forever. Destroy your house, build a boat, spurn property, and save life. Thus given the message, he through divine providence understood its context. Enlil, the god of the sky, had grown tired of life on earth. The gnashing of teeth, the stink of smoke, the noise, 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 always noise. He would end this tired experiment called mortality. He would wash it away in a storm, and from this storm a flood which would rage for seven days and cleanse the earth of all the things that walked and crawled, leaving every city underwater, every story forgotten. Enki, the sea god, learned of this plan and was horrified. Enki loved the living, knew that beneath the chewing and the fire and the racket, there was something truly special about life, something no god could possibly comprehend, something delicate, precious, transient. He felt a duty to preserve life, to keep it in any way he could, and so he chose this pious old man to undertake the great task of preserving life as a seed preserves a bud. Pazur listened to this story and knew it was true from the moment it was spoken. It burdened his heart terribly. He knew that what he had been told was a secret and must be kept so. He knew that if the people of the two rivers found out what Enlil was planning, they wouldn't move to preserve life. They would simply tear themselves apart. And not to mention the boat. Puzur's tears wet his hands, and he could feel the elder's eyes upon him, daunting and stern in purpose. We must cover the top of the boat, Puzur Amori. We cannot let the sky god see what we are about, and we cannot let the rain of his wrath drown us. Do you see? Pazur looked up from his sobbing and met Utnapishtim's eyes. Us? You mean to bring me with you? And your men, and my children, and my wife, and two of each animal. We bring life to start anew, Pazur Amuri. We bring life to start anew. On the last day of the boat building, as the men and their families gathered to celebrate with drink and food all paid for by their noble benefactor, Pazur's head hung low. He had not yet told his men the truth of their task, and was unsure how to go about it. As the sun set and the men grew drunk and happy, something stirred just off the workspace on the bank of the river. Some paused, some didn't notice, but when the stirring became a rumble, all stopped and stood to see what was approaching them. A lurching mass in the black was lit by their bonfire, and it took them a moment of stunned silence to realize that snakes, insects, lizards, and crocodiles were emerging from the bushes and stampeding towards them. The men held their wives to them, and the wives scooped their children off the ground and made to flee, but in the Pishtim raised his hands and told them to stand still. They did, and as the slithering, crawling things made their way between their legs, their horror turned to fascination. The animals seemed under some spell. They made their way to the boat, slithering and scampering up the gangplank and into the lower deck. As the men watched this happen, they were too amazed to notice the pair of hippopotamus saunter through their ranks and up into the boat. 
This went on until dawn, animals emerging from the grass and into the boat, walking two by two like an impossible menagerie. Monkey walked ahead of ostrich, walked ahead of lion, walked ahead of elephant. None fought or bit or clawed. From the tiniest insect to the greatest oxen, they all seemed to have put their instinctual differences aside in order to pack themselves into the ark. What is happening, Pazura Mori? How is this possible? asked the workers. Pazur told them the truth, the whole story in every detail. Some didn't believe, some did. The ones who did made their preparations, gathered their wives and children, and kissed the feet of Utnapishtim, who had been blessed by the god of mercy to save them. The non-believers asked in exasperated tones to be paid their final salary, and were. A few of the men made for the city to warn the people of Shurupak, but it was too late. The time had come. The dawn was dark, and with it came a light rain. Utnapishtim's wife had burned their home and brought with her a flock of sheep to the workstation. The men watched in awe as Utnapishtim and his wife ascended the gangplank, followed by their sheep, and were greeted by each animal, great and small, predator and prey, all prostrating themselves before them. The men craned their necks to see a haze of birds, insects, and bats swarm the boat and make for its entrance behind the old couple. When the last dragonfly had found its place on the walls of the ark's interior, Utnapishtim turned to Pazur, his men, and their families, and said, Come, and you will live to see the sun again. Some of the men made to get the ark into the water, but Pazur stopped them and told them to unlash the restraints that held it to the earth and get the bitumen ready to seal the entrance shut from the inside. The tide of the river was rising and thunder began to grumble over the black clouds. The earth felt as if it were shivering in fear, and cracks formed in the earth which began to spill forth a dark, bubbling muck. Pazur could smell that it was salt water, and it sent his heart racing with fear. The men climbed into the ark, and with Pazur's supervision, lifted the gangplank with rope to seal the entrance. They slathered bitumen onto the seams on every deck. After a few hours, the boat began to rumble and shake violently, and all at once, they could feel the sensation of being lifted. They looked at each other, barely able to make out their own shapes in the blackness. The deluge had come. Utnapishtim's prophecy had been realized. The boat's decks were caked with life, but there was no sound except the storm. No insect buzzed, no lion growled, nothing moved in the darkness. They could hear the water pounding the boat, but their work was strong, and the hull held. The wood groaned as violent winds pushed the ark this way and that. Everyone sat still, listening to the howling of the storm and the wailing of the goddess Ishtar as the world died in a sea of cleansing. Enlil pounded his fists, shaking the whole of creation, sweeping everything under the ocean. The crew of the Ark dared not make a sound when they heard men drown and die outside. They clawed at the boat's hull, begging to be allowed to live. The world was black, and for seven days Enlil and his storm gods, Shular, Hanish, and Adad, struck the earth with lightning, cracking it apart so that the seawater might spew forth and cover the land. Their wrath was so terrible that the other gods fled up to heaven to wait out the deluge, petrified of this calamitous and impulsive act by their king. The bodies of men and beast littered the ocean floor as fish litter the sea their cities drowned and carpeted by coral and shark. The sky was blanketed with rain cloud so thick it was as if the sun had fled Enlil's fury. The gods wept from heaven, for who now would worship them? Who would sacrifice to their honor and be awed by their radiance and power? Enlil, they said, was not a god of the sky, 
but a god of death, a god of wrath. After seven long days, the storm subsided. The people in the boat had waited in complete silence. No one ate, slept, or defecated. No animal stirred for the whole seven days. The silence was broken by the call of a rooster on the upper deck as it caught the slightest glimpse of the sun through a kink in the woven upper hull of the boat. Una pished him, who had been seated on the upper deck in deep contemplation, stirred. He rose to his feet and pushed against the top of the boat, punching a hole in the roof. It gave way, and with it, sunshine illuminated the interior. Men, women, and children, as if waking from a dream, marveled at the great beast standing among them. Udnapishtim crawled up to the top of the deck, and everyone listened, watching the bright blue sky through the hole. After a while, they heard wailing. Pazur got to his feet and came up to find the old man on his knees, sobbing into his hands, shoulders heaving. He mourned for the world as people came slowly out into the light to find an ocean with no end. As the people emerged from the boat to stand on the surface and marvel at this new sea that covered the whole of creation, their awe turned to scared anger. What will we do now? asked the people. You've doomed us to a fate worse than death. We're stranded with a bunch of animals in the middle of nowhere. Pazor stood tall and shouted in anger at these accusations. Everything the Elder has said has come to pass. Everything he has prophesied has happened. You sat side by side with elephants, scorpions, snakes, and lions, each of whom obey the Elder's power. He has saved you, saved your children, saved life itself. How can you doubt him now? The people of the boat watched as Utnapishtim outstretched his hand, where from the hole in the roof of the ark, a white dove fluttered forth and landed upon it. The old man whispered to the bird, and it flew off. They waited for a day. The dove returned. Udnapishtim stretched his hand, and from the hole in the roof of the ark came a swallow, who landed on it. The old man whispered to the bird, and it flew off. They waited for a day. The swallow returned. Udnapishtim outstretched his hand, and from the hole in the roof of the ark came a crow, who landed on it. The old man whispered to the bird, and it flew off. They waited for a day, and waited for another day, and waited for another day. Perhaps it had died out at sea. Perhaps the gods had snatched it out of the sky. Another day of waiting, and the crow returned. Its black claws were caked in earth, its beak stained with blood. The people cheered as Utnapishtim declared that their new land was close, as the crow flies. Eventually, the ship was wedged in the rocks of a mountain summit, which crawled desperately with small rodents and birds who had fled to the rising tide and hidden in the folds of the mountain from the storm. As the tide fell away and the rock gave way to fresh earth, the men tore open the sealed yang plank, and all at once the animals stirred and came back to themselves, thundering out into the land to continue their lives. The men cheered and hugged their wives and children, parading them out of the ark and onto the mountain, where they would make a new home. But in the Pishtim told them that their work was not yet done. By the mercy and will of the gods we were spared, and it falls to us to tell them that we have survived. The men worried at this. What would Enlil think to know that his plan had been thwarted? But Puzur reminded them again to trust in the Elder and do as he asked. He tasked them with dismantling the boat and building with its carcass a ziggurat. They set about their work, spurning shelter and comfort, to build an altar of wood and reed and rock. They used the rope soaked in bitumen to build a great fire atop the ziggurat, and upon it slaughtered one of the sheep Utnapishtim's wife had brought on board, sending the black smoke of sacrifice up to heaven. The gods descended from heaven. Some men fled. Others bowed their heads in the dirt. First among them was Enki, 
who laughed with joy as the other gods set foot on the new earth and tried to hide their marveling at the ingenuity of these mortals. You survived! Blessed Utnapisht him! said Enki, as he made the floodwaters recede even more, revealing vast forests and good earth. You built the Ark and saved all of these precious lives. Life will go on. I couldn't be happier. Enlil appeared behind Enki, towering over all the gods. His presence cast a great darkness over the mountain, but on his face he wore a look of great shame. Blessed Utnapishtim, he spoke, his voice like thunder. You have defied my wrath and given this world a second chance at life. I can only be grateful for this act of rebellion against my will. To wipe out all life was, perhaps a little impulsive. As such, I have a gift for you. Call your wife here. Utnapishtim did as he was told and took his wife by the hand, ascending the ziggurat and bowing to Enlil, who placed a thumb on each of their foreheads. You have defeated death, and so you will live forever. You are gods, like us, Utnapishtim. Divine and sacred, everlasting shall you be. Now come, to where the river's mouths meet, and you shall be at peace for eternity. Utnapishtim rose to his feet, and in a flash of light, the gods had all disappeared, all except for Enki, who sat atop the ziggurat, licking his thumbs to taste the last of the sacrifice. Pazur stood at the base of the structure, watching him. I suppose, said Enki, that you're wondering what is left for you, boat builder. No, said Puzur Amuri. No, you built the boat, you and your men. It is left to you to restart humanity. You do not wonder at your reward. It doesn't matter, said Puzur Amuri. The gods can make great storms, wipe the world away as it suits them to do so and expect a sacrifice in their honor for it. But I am only a builder of boats. I cannot command the waves. I cannot stop the storm. I can only survive it. My reward is that it will never be said that I had to apologize for killing the world, Great Enki. My reward is that I will grow old and learn from what has happened here. Enki's mouth hung agape at this answer and he watched, trying not to let his face curl into a smile, as Pazura Mori turned and descended the mountain to join the others and begin again. For our first episode, I chose this story for a couple of reasons. The first is that it appears in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Utnapishtim, living with his wife for many years after the events of the Flood, have been forgotten by humanity. He's visited by the king of Uruk and asked how he came to be immortal. This story is his answer. The second reason I chose this story is that it might be the oldest story we have. We all know it, all tell it, or have been told a version of it at one point or another. It's one of the central narratives of all three Abrahamic religions, and it's been retold and reimagined by everyone from Walt Disney to Darren Aronofsky. Most of you are probably familiar with the Noah story, in which God cleanses the world of the sinful, but spares one holy man, his family, and two of every creature on earth. When I learned the Sumerian version of the story, I instantly liked it better. I like that rather than an act of dogma, the Flood is portrayed in the Sumerian version as an act of impulse. I'm fond, you'll find, of a fallible god. The Utnapishtim story is a great deal older than the Noah telling. Classicists and archaeologists of the Victorian age had a sense that this story might be quite a bit older than the Bible. But the confirmation of this fact came when an Assyriologist named George Smith translated the 11th tablet of the Epic of Gilgamesh and discovered there a recitation of the Flood myth in a completely independent context from biblical writ. There's an urban legend that when he translated this tablet, he grew so excited that he tore off his clothing and babbled in tongues. 
I believe the truth of this story may be that the shock of this discovery was so great that Smith suffered an epileptic episode. Puzuramuri is a very minor character in the Flood Myth. All that's really known about him is that he built the Pishtim's boat and was his first mate on the fateful voyage. He was perfect for me, as I could ascribe him whatever attributes I needed to tell the story. A man caught in the whims of the storm, as it were, just trying to get by. The Sumerian gods are fascinating entities. They're capricious and wrathful like the Greek gods, but their role as deities seems to me to have a lack of inherent stature of, say, a Zeus or a Poseidon. They're a bit more like the Norse gods, more tools of folklore than religion, worshipped, surely, but understood to be relatable in their fallibility. We probably have Christendom to thank for all this difference, as the European classicists who venerated the ancient society that birthed the Olympians sought to recontextualize the Greek myths, washing them of their funky, untoward ancient sensibilities, turning scoundrels like Zeus, Apollo, and Ares into paragons. The myths surrounding the Sumerian gods are not above being framed so that the gods, not the mortals in the story, are meant to learn the lesson. That's comforting to me, the idea that even the Most High can be less than graceful. If you're curious about the Flood myth, the work of George Smith, or Assyriology in general, I recommend the Flood Before Noah, by one of the world's most eminent and entertaining Assyriologists, Irving Finkel. Finkel is a wonderful writer and a cartoonishly charming character himself, and his insights into the history of Assyriology, and in particular the Flood myth, are indispensable. If this first episode of Breakfast with Gilgamesh can be considered a success, a great deal of the credit must go to Professor Finkel. So if you're out there listening to this, Irving, thank you. If you'd like to support the show, you can find us on patreon.com slash breakfastwithgilgamesh. And if you'd like to read fiction by your humble host and author accompanied by the incredible artwork of talented artists, you can find it at zkleverton.com. A special thanks to Sam Beck, who designed my beautiful logo, Thomas Holden, who composed the wonderful music you heard throughout, and to all the friends and partners who made this project possible with their time and insight. Next episode, we head to Nottingham to get lost in the endless forest of Apocrypha with the green archer, Robin Hood. Join us then for more Breakfast with Gilgamesh.